happy Father's Day. So glad you're here. I was talking to a friend of mine recently that mentioned he's been to a number of churches, and there's always a difference between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Mother's Day is always, Mom, you're the best. We love you, on and on. Father's Day is always like, ah. Men need to take responsibility. Men need to be better, that sort of thing. I ran across a video this week of women that pay $4,000 a week to go to scream therapy camp to get over men and their relationships. Here it is, right here. Uh, this is, we could host this. Do you love this? Oh, that's, that's somebody's wife right there. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, there she goes. Bam. All right, we're good. <laughs> Men are usually scapegoats, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, in World War II, Dr. Murray Bowen was a doctor that tried to help men who were suffering from anxiety, and he had been trained in Freudian analysis. Freudian analysis, essentially all of your problems are inside. Sit down on a couch, let's delve into your subconscious, the problem is in there. But he discovered that actually the pal they handled anxiety had a lot to do with the people that he lived with out here. The problem wasn't in here. The problem was out there. And Bowen was the one that developed family systems theory. That problems don't begin in here and then take them out there, right? You got this thing that's going wrong with you and you bring it out. Instead, we take problems from out there and we bring them in here. Do you believe that? That the majority of our problems stem from outside, we bring them in, rather than, man, if we can just get to the core of what's messed up in your head or whatever, then we can fix everything out there. Usually therapists before Bowen, they would say, here is a guy named Jim. Jim has a problem. How can we figure out what's going on with Jim? And then Bowen said there's a better question to ask. The better question to ask is, here is Jim. What is it about his family system that is causing Jim to act that way? And so Bowen says that in a healthy family, um, healthy families um, produce children that have a differentiated self. In other words, a young adult that has learned to face and work through issues still connected to their family in a loving way, but they have a differentiated self. They're healthy, they are differentiated in every way. And the problem that we're gonna see in the passage that we're talking about today is that there is something that Bowen points out that is called family projection. That usually what happens, the extended family, there's the process in family projection where parents will transmit their emotional problems onto their children. And that happens in unhealthy families. And the children, rather than becoming a differentiated self, um, they face some problems. And here's exactly how this happens. There are two examples. One is um, scan, diagnose, and treat. So uh, whenever you have a child that's going through something, you'll scan them, you'll immediately, you'll diagnose them, whether you know you're doing this or not, and then you'll treat them. And usually this process follows three steps, Bowen said. Parents will fear something is wrong with a child, they will find evidence that confirms their fear, and then they will treat their child as if something is actually wrong, without actually having any empirical evidence whatsoever. And so two examples of this are, number one, self-esteem projection, right? A parent scans their child, finds evidence that they have low self-esteem, and as a result, what do parents naturally do for a child that has low self-esteem? You'll constantly praise them. You'll constantly encourage and praise and praise and praise and praise and praise, 
And when the child eventually gets to a point where they don't get praised, which is basically the rest of their life, it affects their self-esteem. And this is what parents are doing. They're projecting onto their child that an issue that usually they're wrestling with. A healthier way to build self-esteem is to enroll your children in things that are dangerous but closely monitored, like soccer and basketball and band and chorus and karate and lacrosse. Right? They get into these situations. They are potentially, they're going to get hurt relationally or even physically. And they're going to have to figure it out for themselves. And what they discover is, I am enough. Someone that has learned early on that I don't need the constant intervention of parents to work, they learn that I am enough. These are the type of boys and girls that grow up in a marriage situation and they say I am enough and they're able to recognize unhealthy paradigms. Another one is anxiety product projection where the parent will fear that the child is anxious and so what will they do? They'll withdraw the child from all kinds of anxious situations. Parents do this all the time in school. They're anxious in school, I'll take them out of this school. So I'll put them in this other school that's going to, and I'll take them out of that school, and then I'll homeschool, and then I'll take them out of this, and that sort of thing. Where Bowen says, commonly what's happening is the exact opposite needs to happen. Where if the child is constantly taken out of the situation that is causing them anxiety, they'll never deal with their anxiety. And so in a family system, everyone has roles to play and rules to obey. In a good, healthy family, that's true. Everyone has roles. Everyone has rules. In unhealthy rules, or in unhealthy roles that appear in family systems, there, are, there is the protector, the enabler, the favorite, the scapegoat. In unhealthy family systems, things are reversed usually. In an unhealthy family system, there are rules like we don't talk about dad's drinking or this is the brother that has a lot of emotional needs and so it's just, they're the one that's going to get all the time and attention. That's just an unspoken rule. Now, birth order affects this. Raise your hand if you're a firstborn. Hold up your hand high and proud. You're going to do it because you're a rule follower. Let's go. Hold this firstborn child hands up. Give me a youngest born child. Let me see those hands. Who's ready for the party to happen, right? You got the youngest child. How many of you were only children, right? And you're independent and that sort of thing. How many of you are a twin? Okay, good. Now, did I forget anybody? Oh, oh, the middle child. Well, of course I did. Of course I did, right? I love this meme right here, right? Happy Middle Child Day. Uh, oh, you didn't notice it was Middle Child Day? Of course not. No one ever does, right? I am a middle child, right? And so all of these different things affect how we operate. Today we're finishing a series called Courage Under Fire. And we've been talking about how when we become disciples of Jesus, we do things differently. And one of the things that we do differently as disciples of Jesus is we stop blaming. We stop, you're the problem, dad. You're the problem, mom. You're the problem, sister. You're, and what you do is you become, instead of a peacekeeper, a peacemaker. You're looking at not just the person, but you're looking at the entirety of what produces the person. Disciples of Jesus don't blame. Disciple of Jesus take responsibility to create a system that's healthy. Now, one of the, one of the stories that I love in the Bible is found in the book of Genesis. There, the book of Genesis is three families, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Basically, father, son, grandson. Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how God takes this really broken family system and he redeems it. And that's because everybody loves a redemption story 
Everybody loves to be a part of a redemption story, and everybody wants their story to be redeemed. Everyone, in some way, shape, or form, needs God to intervene and to help heal and change. Now, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. As I read this, I want you to pay attention to this. You're going to automatically notice things that just seem not right. This is 4,000 years ago, and it begins. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padam Aram, and sister of Laban the Aram, Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless, and the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The baby jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? She went to inquire of the Lord, what's going on in my stomach? Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was hairy. He was called Esau, which means in Hebrew, hairy skin and complexion. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Jacob means the one that grabs the heel. Isaac was 60 years old old when Rebecca had twins. The boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. So if you haven't picked up on that, let me just sort of identify. There are four unhealthy family dynamics going here. The first is Isaac and Rebecca's favoritism. You're like, this is parenting 101. What the heck? What a jerk move. You don't favor one child over another. You just don't do that. That's, that's basic. That's the obvious one that you see. The better, the better you know, Freud would say, what's, what's the problem with Jacob? Or what's the problem with Rebecca? And what Bowen would say is, what was going on in Isaac and Rebecca's family system that made them pull such a jerk move? Dynamic number two, Isaac and Rebecca's age. Isaac is the only person in the Bible that paid a, that paid a pediatrician with their social security check. <laughs> I want you to think of that, right? Now, historians tell us in the ancient Near East 4,000 years ago, if you reach 95, you have outlived 95% of the people on the planet. Your teeth had rotted out, your eyesight was gone, your hearing was gone, you have worms in your intestines, you spent a lifetime with protein deficiency, and someone hands you twins and says they need to be changed. Can you imagine that dynamic? Third dynamic. Dynamic number three, Isaac and Rebecca's terrible role models. Now, Tolstoy says, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And Isaac's father, Abraham, was jacked up. This bro was Genesis chapter 12. His wife, Sarah, was beautiful. God calls Abraham and Sarah to leave the, 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 the fertile crescent, come down to Israel, and what's the first thing he does? He knows all the men there are going to kill him. So he says, Sarah, his wife, is what? His sister. And you can just imagine what happened there. Genesis 16. Sarah can't have kids. So Sarah tells Abraham, why don't you have sex with the housekeeper and have a child? Listen, men. That's a bad idea. Don't do that. Genesis 20. Again, people were falling in love with Sarah. So what does Abraham do? Did he learn from his mistake? No. What does it say? He said, she is my sister. So if this was your dad, 
Can you imagine how that would affect you? Dynamic number four, Jacob and Esau's different personalities and gifts. Verse 27 says, the boy grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. Now, if we were trying to describe a young man today like that, how would we describe them? They're an outdoorsman, right? They have an Instagram account where they go on adventures, hiking in the back country and hunting and eating their own food and that sort of thing. That was someone that was very valued 4,000 years ago. It says, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Who would Jacob be today? Like a gamer maybe? You know what I'm saying? Trying to tell his parents, I don't need to go to college, I'm already making $800,000 a year as a gamer as my, on, my, on my channel. Now, you have to ask the question, as a dad, what is Isaac thinking? Isaac is looking at his two sons and he's thinking, he scans them and he immediately thinks there's something wrong with Jacob. Now, what's wrong with this kid? And that's why God has you in the room today. So Isaac never hears his parents talk about the half-brother Ishmael. Isaac never sees his parents resolve anything about the way Sarah is treated. Isaac brings two sons into this painful family situation, values Esau more, which causes Rebecca to value Jacob more, and then you fast forward to the teenage years. Because everybody knows, as a parent, it gets easier during the teenage years, right? <laughs> Verse 29, once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the country famished. And he saw Jacob in the kitchen, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Now, I, I translated this from the Hebrew, and this is how it reads literally in the Hebrew. Let me swallow, please, some of that red stuff, for I'm starving. Let me have some of that red stuff. Give it to me right now, you know, Brian Regan would say. You know, I'm going to die. Now, and so Jacob replies, first sell me your birthright. What's a birthright? In the ancient Near East, the oldest son usually stayed nearby. And what they would do, the oldest son would receive more money in the inheritance to take care of the parents. And so Jacob, at home, a little sly, says, I'll give it to you. Give me, give me your birthright. Verse 32, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and he left. Now I want you to notice this line. Esau despised Jacob. Now did Esau just not like Jacob? Or were there other factors in play that helped him not like his brother? Here's the thing I think this passage is saying to all of us. As disciples of Jesus, God is calling each of us to allow him to redeem our story and our family's story. I haven't drawn you a picture in a while. You ready? Get ready. Here's, here's, here's what you get, people. I'm going to have to draw it again here. This is what you get when you send your kids to advanced art lessons. This is what you call a genogram. I, if this was you, you would draw you, and do you have any siblings? And then you're going to put their husband and kids. You're going to draw that, right? And then... There's Charlie and Darlene. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Charlie and Darlene. That's my mom and dad. They have siblings, right? Right? My dad had two brothers. My mom, two half siblings. My dad's dad. Frank. 
His dad, Marcus. His dad, Ambrose, who was caught in a Civil War camp. And when he tried to escape it, was shot in the back. And then him, John Ray, who lived in Virginia and came all the way over to Kentucky. This is called a genogram. And your assignment from Jesus, or you will die, is to draw a genogram. And what I want you to do is I want you to draw a genogram, and I want you to fill in every possible person. This is Frank and Rika. This is Marcus and Sarah. This is Ambrose and whatever. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down the stuff. I remember I was visiting home one time, and I'm showing dad, and I had jotted down little notes in the genogram, and my dad said, wait a minute, you're not looking for that stuff, are you? I said, what? What what do you, what? Actually, yes. I'm looking for the stuff. He said, don't go digging up that stuff. And I said, I would like to know about myself. And so what I want you to understand is that you, where you are right now, you are the sum total of Five, four, three, two, one, five generations, they say. All of that is your family system. All of it has a direct relationship to who you've become. And your job as a disciple of Jesus is not to be the person that says, my family sucks, you suck, you're the worst, but I want to understand where I came from. And as Joseph said in the Old Testament, it stops with me, okay? So what I want to do is I want to ask a couple questions here. This is going to help you as you assess where you are. The first, first question is this. Are you running from your family? Are you running from your family? Bowen said one of the coping me- mechanisms that kid will use to deal with pain in their family of origin is what he calls emotional cutoff. Now, some will literally leave home and go as far as possible. Others will emotionally cut off and leave home and avoid difficult conversations. There are many people, this is an area where people usually stay in the area, but my question to you is, if your family is still in the area, are you emotionally cut off with them even though you may see them every single week? So we start in our 20s and 30s asking who we are, we get in our 40s and 50s and 60s. I've seen people here at CCV in their 80s and 90s get a picture on who they are and become healthier people. See, here's the thing. thing. God can't redeem what you keep avoiding. So the second thing is, how how do I know if I'm in the process of being redeemed? How do I know when I'm a healthy person in my family system? And I just want to point you to this quote from Scott Peck, and it's this. You know you've reached maturity when you can go back into your family system and not revert back to your old patterns or hate your family members, okay? And what I mean by that is you come back from college or you never left and you're here, you know you're healthy when two things are happening simultaneously. Number one, When the family's back, you don't jump back into your old role, who you used to be and how you used to act. And so if you're with your family system and you're not jumping back into that role, awesome. You're a differentiated self. You're becoming a disciple of Jesus that is whole and that is being healed. But people can go and spend time with their family and then you have this burning underneath of anger. And that is a sign that there is something to deal with, to be expressed, to be talked through, to be healed. And it's only when you can be with them and not go back to your old self 
and when you're with them and you don't feel anger, anger, that you know that you're in the process of being redeemed. So my question is, how are you doing? How are you doing right now? It takes courage to say, it stops with me. It takes courage not to blame. It takes courage to allow God to come in and create a redemption story for you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in our community. Over this last six months, you have been bringing so much healing and you have been bringing so much insight to all of us. We thank you for the example of these people in scripture. We thank you that you recorded them and you were honest. And we thank you that you've made a better way through Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.